Welcome to Conversations That Count. Happy Saturday to you all. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I am Sri Lekha Pali, Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Community Engagement. One of the goals of Conversations That Count is to discuss the current issues that are happening in our nation and bring in experts that can articulate these issues very well so all of you can make informed decisions. This week, I have invited Carrie Campbell Severino. As most of you already know, Carrie is a judicial expert, and I'm very thankful that she's on Conversations That Count. Ms. Severino is the president of the Judicial Crisis Network and co-author of the best-selling book, Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation, and the Future of the Court. As an expert on the confirmation process, I couldn't have asked for a better guest to come in during this time. Carrie, welcome to Conversations That Count. Thanks, Srini. It's great to be here. I'm sure you've been quite busy since yesterday, as though you were never busy before. I know you have a very hectic schedule. So yesterday, as you know, we had a historic decision made by U.S. Supreme Court overturning Roe, Roe v. Wade. So what are your thoughts? Let's get started with that. Yeah, well, I mean, Yesterday was an incredibly um, exciting day because this is a case, you know, if you could think of any Supreme Court case that was the best example of where the court has gone wrong in terms of departing from the Constitution, uh, Roe versus Wade is really it. Not because of the, the policy results, that's a different question, but just in terms of the legal question, it is just abundantly clear that abortion, the, the right to abortion is found nowhere in the Constitution. There is no text there for it. There's no nothing. And the way that people are trying to kind of use the text of the Constitution as a blank check to just insert whatever rights they think are important is illustrative of the problems with judicial interpretation. Now we finally, after decades of hard work, have a majority of justices on the court who actually get that and who are willing to apply the proper understanding of the Constitution, even when they get huge amounts of pushback, historic levels. I mean, we had an assassination attempt. We have rioting. We have people firebombing pregnancy crisis, pregnancy centers. It is just the, the, the amount of pressure on them was incredible. And they were willing to stand up to it, knowing that their job was not to make you know the crowds happy, not to look at opinion polls, uh, but to read the Constitution and do what it says. And in the long term, that is really going to be the best thing for the integrity of the court, for the is it institution, and for the American people and our country. Very, very well said. So it's, I see so much passion in you. And there are millions of people who have fought for this day for over 50 years and prayed for this day. So why do you think there is so much uh, polarization about this issue in this great nation? As an immigrant, uh, it, it just is very surprising to me. I've been here for two decades. One of the two of the issues that I can't get grasp on is gun control or gun, uh, Second Amendment rights. And this, I think the most polarization issues are these two. So can you talk to me about that just a bit? Yeah. And, and we had big Supreme Court cases in them two days in a row. Right. So this is like the hot button issue uh, week here. Um, you know, I think Part of the reason this is a very polarizing issue is because of the way the Supreme Court constitutionalized it in a way that's not in the Constitution. So there's a kind of a contrast with the Second Amendment issue. The Second Amendment actually is in the Constitution and has been there, you know, since the beginning. It's in the Bill of Rights, but for a long time wasn't being actually enforced strongly. And, and it really until the term that I clerked for Justice Thomas um, in 2008 with, came down with the Heller decision, finally saying, oh, okay, we're actually going to enforce this as written. And I think that uh, that shocked a lot of people uh, to be like, oh, we're, we're doing this again. We're actually enforcing what's in the Constitution. Roe is kind of the, the flip side of that. It's something that wasn't in the Constitution. It was a hotly debated issue in the 70s. And the court, by inventing a right and put, kind of putting it into the Constitution, then took an issue that the Constitution left to the elected branches that for most of American history, 150 years, 250 years by that point, had, had been in dealt with in the elected branches and then suddenly said, nope, here's our solution. We're gonna have a one size fits all solution. We're going to decide what how to address this issue. It's so strongly held because, you know, for, for those of us who are pro-life, we're going, this is this is a human being. We're taught people talk about it as if it's a um, you know, like whether the, the decision of whether I should get pregnant or not. Of course, that is a very personal decision. But once another human being is there, uh, once there's another life involved, 
you don't get to say, well, yeah, but this isn't a good time for me. Just as with my six children that I have at home, I can't say, oh, this is a really bad time for me to have a sixth kid. I'm going to take my daughter and, you know, just get rid of her. You can't do that. <laughs> this is someone who's already there. And I think the challenge is in the 70s, obviously, we, 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 we had known really enough science to understand that for a long time. But uh, having the technology and development since then, where now we have ultrasounds, now we all have seen pictures of our own children, of our, of our friends um, in, in utero, you, you know, the gender reveal parties where you can tell if it's a boy or a girl well before they're born, all of those things um, have changed it so people can go, okay, wait a minute, what are, what are we doing here? On the one hand, I understand that there are women who are in really difficult situations, but is the solution then to try to make it possible for them to end the life of their child? Or as I think we're starting to see a push in some of these states that are addressing the issue now, um, should the solutions be, how can we help these women to feel that they have options to give them mentoring, to give them assistance, so they feel they can bear children and either put them up for adoption or, or raise them themselves? These are tough questions. It's a huge issues. And that's part of the reason this is something that is so was so damaging for the court to take out of the hands of the American people because it involves these major issues of life and death. Anything that's in the that's not in the Constitution itself does need to be dealt with. And that in, in, the, in the political spheres and that allows people to kind of try to figure out how to balance all of the competing concerns uh, their own way rather than focus it on unelected judges who aren't really qualified to make those decisions. Uh, Carrie, you, uh, you said it very well. So what would be the implications for each state? Uh, for example, I'm kind of thinking about Virginia. I'm sure you saw our Governor Youngkin and Lieutenant Governor Ms. Sears and Attorney General Jason Meares mm -hmm. released a um, statement supporting this. So what would be the implications for Virginians? Well, uh, Virginia right now has one of the most liberal abortion regimes in the country. So basically, you know, full steam ahead on the board and, and nothing about this decision will change that. But what it, what it does change is it means that the Virginians as people, we have the opportunity now to say, hey, actually, maybe we don't want that, that expanse of a regime. We know Governor Northam before this was, was all for abortion and actually uh, shockingly was talking about the idea of leaving children to die after birth. So really pushing it into the fourth trimester here, which is kind of, you know, on the, on the far edge of things. Um, now there's no question. I think for a long time it was like, well, you know, can states, what can states even do? And it was very hard for states to figure out how can we protect fetal life? Now we know the Supreme Court has said very clearly that is something that states do have the ability to protect. And so I'm, I'm glad to see the governor, uh, Youngkin is interested in doing that. I think, uh, the Virginians on, on, on the whole are going to now have a voice where they can decide, Hey, we want to be more protective of, of infant life and find ways that we can support the woman and the child and not make it a false uh, dichotomy and a false decision that it has to be, that one has to die to, to support the other. Kerry, I'm glad you brought up about what um, Northam said. He's a pediatrician by background. I'm a healthcare professional. So that was quite shocking to me. And I'm sure you still remember Delegate Kathy Tran supporting that bill and putting out that kids that it's fine for infants to be killed after they're out of the womb, which I think is bizarre and it just kind of breaks my heart even till today, thinking that that came from a pediatrician and a physician. Yeah. So, um, Carrie, I also would like to talk about the riots that happened before that, but I think before we go there, I would love to understand what uh, the, mo the momentum that's going on in front of the Supreme Court. I'm sure you heard about what's happening in Washington, D.C. What do you think of that? You think that's going to subside at a certain point? Is this just the momentum of things or? Oh yeah, I, I, I actually really do. I, even just watching after the leak of this decision um, and, and I, I guess with my, my line of work, I do a lot of media so I can kind of, I gotta get the pulse of things by how people are covering it. And I, I was amazed by how quickly, you know, it went from being, oh my gosh, this is the top story, everyone's hair is on fire to, okay, what's next? And I think, um, well, to some, to some extent, that's, that's a, a problem with our society that we can be very easily distracted from things. I do think it also illustrates that people who say, oh, this is this is issue is going to go, you know, make people go crazy. It's going to ch totally change, uh, you know, everything about, I, I'm not actually sure that's the case. I think um, in most states that you're seeing these, uh, these big demonstrations, you know, Los Angeles and in Chicago and New York, 
they already have uh, the most abor liberal abortion laws out there. California was flirting with things like Governor Northam was talking about, saying, hey, maybe perinatal death, which encompasses death several weeks after birth, um, could be non-prosecutable. That's really shocking. So, you know, I think people are are being uh, are, are obviously upset in those places, but those are the places where their voice has been heard and they have a, a abortion regime that that fits what they're looking at. The most states actually don't want to see abortion for all nine months and then some, and I think they'll they'll be able to do that. I think also what you're seeing in some of these protests right now is a uh, disproportionately one side, and I don't think that's because that's the only side that cares about it. I know a lot of people who've spent their whole careers uh, working on the life issue who are actually afraid for their safety to go to the Supreme Court yesterday that wanted to be there, but said, you know what, I I am I am really scared because we have seen people, um, you know, Antifa linked groups that have been firebombing pro-life pregnancy centers. It's an ironic way to try to support women by bombing places that are giving them free diapers and, and support and mentoring and training, things like this. But that's how radical and crazy some of the people are. Um, so I think that, I think that does mean that you're, you're seeing disproportionately one side of this. There are a lot of people out there who are praying who are thankful and who are grateful to finally have that um, the stain of abortion taken out of our constitution doesn't mean it's going to that that again in many states the law isn't even going to change some states it will some in a lot of states it won't and I think you know that now it really just opens the door for those in the pro life movement to say okay now now you have the the open door and the chance now you have a chance to to change the 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 um, the policy in, in a direction that you think is going to help uh, support women and children better. Carrie, I think I'm glad you made the distinction saying that even if you want to go and support for pro-life movement, we are not able to go because we are worried about Antifa. And I'm one of those persons. So that doesn't mean that uh, there is not there, there are not enough people that are out there to support pro-life movement. It's just that we are just worried about getting into DC area and trying to do what we have to do. So um, Carrie, I know you you did law clerking under Justice Thomas. I mean, Justice Thomas is revered by many, including myself. To what extent did it impact your judicial philosophy? Well, you know, I wanted to clerk for Justice Thomas because I already admired his judicial philosophy and his approach to the law. I thought, here's the person who is the most, you know, just really just driven by his principles, always knowing that what, what he thinks is the correct uh, constitutional result is going gonna, is gonna to win the day. And he's willing to do it in season and out of season. And um, so I was thrilled when I got that job. I don't think I could have understood at the time how great working for Justice Thomas was, though. I, I just knew him sort of hypothetically and theoretically as a, as a great legal thinker. But Th Justice Thomas is just a great man. For any of you who haven't read his autobiography, My Grandfather's Son, that happened to come out the year I was clerking. Um, and, he, and it was just an incredible story. I mean, here's someone who has was abandoned by his father as a child. His mother wasn't able to afford to care for him and his brother and sister. He and his brother ended up going, moving in with his grandparents who raised them. And this is why he calls it my grandfather's son. He's so, um, he received these values from his grandfather um, in a time when he had so few opportunities. He's living in the segregated South under Jim Crow laws. You know, you would think, oh, here's someone who had in and, and, and not even his parents aren't even aren't even there for him, but he had in his grandfather and his grandmother a stable family who someone he knew would support him. Uh, it's it's ironic because he, his grandfather didn't say he was going to give him even unconditional love. He said, "My door swings one way, but one day it might swing another if you don't if you're not don't have a uh, you know if you if you don't keep follow the line here." And at one point, actually, he did have a, a severing of the relationship because Justice Thomas got into really um, you know the this sort of black power movement, and he was a real radical when he was in college after a. After in his youth, um, you know, he actually even being in the seminary for a while, he was wanted to become a Catholic priest, and then was so frustrated by racism, he found unfortunately even there he got he became very angry, very involved in that movement, and then came back to what he describes as his grandfather's principles. And it, anyway, it's just such a beautiful, inspiring story. There's now a documentary called Created Equal out there about it, and even a book based on his interviews for that documentary by the same title, Created Equal. He just is an inspiration to me to see what he's accomplished with his life through hard work, through recognizing the, the way the American dream speaks to all of us, even, even the, to those of us where 
they've had a lot of hard things to overcome that the 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 values are still there and he he um is it just someone who who cares that out in everything he does at the, at the court he knows the name of everyone who works there from the the chief justice down to the janitor and he cares about them he'll talk to them and you know ask them about how their family is doing he knows what basketball team they're rooting for and will joke about the games in the hallway you know he really is just a genuine human being and i feel like he's someone we could all um aspire to be more like yeah, Thierry, what an honor to kind of have worked with him. You're just one blessed woman, I can tell you that. So, Thierry, I also want to bring about infamous Supreme Court leak with this historic victory that happened to pro-life. I really never want our nation to forget what happened to Supreme Court, which is another unprecedented uh, leak. So immediately when the leak happened, a lot of us in the community, just like us, uh, like normal, regular people that are not on TV, that don't belong to judicial world, we tried to analyze what the leak might be and it's informed speculations to a certain degree but uh, really nowhere near the what i imagine the supreme court clerk text uh, text chains looked like so how would you assess where the leak was likely to come from i also my question would be why did you and your former what did you and your former supreme court clerk colleagues think in terms of analyzing this when you saw this story and also the tax well, just to underscore how historic this is, I, I talked to a lot of people who were former clerks who immediately assumed this must be fake. Like, there's no way this could be real because they it's just something that's not done. We couldn't leave the building with a copy of an internal document like that. Even of our own draft of opinion, it hadn't been approved by a single justice. We would not have been allowed to leave the building. Um, and so the idea that someone would hand this, you know, the entire full complete draft as circulated to Politico was just outrageous. So a lot of people didn't even believe it at first. But then I think the most most clerks I have spoken to um, just automatically assumed this must be from coming from one of the liberal justices chambers, like not the justice himself, probably, although who knows, probably one of their clerks who thinks this is this is something that's going to cause so much uproar that maybe it will convince some of the conservative judges to change their position. And they were right. It definitely caused a lot of uproar as we, you know, everything up to a attempted assassination on one of the justices. And that points out one of the risks of leaking these things. I mean, it's bad enough. If we had had no leak and the decision came down yesterday, it would have it would have been a huge firestorm. Don't get me wrong. In some ways, the leak kind of spread that out. So maybe it was less intense than it would have been. But the idea that you had this leak before it was final meant that there was an even bigger target on the justices backs because there were people including this one man who was arrested who thought maybe we can change the course of history by actually killing one of the justices that is a horrible incentive let alone the fact that you know clerks are given so much confidence and trust at the court uh, and for a lawyer being able to trust someone with 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 confidential information is central to your job the idea that someone would violate that, I think that that ought, that is grounds for not only them obviously losing their job at the court, but also really not being admitted into the legal profession. I don't think they should be receive a bar license or they should be disbarred if they did so. That level of it's it's kind of like disclosing your client's confidential information because you're disclosing the court's uh, very confidential information. And now we see the reason it was so important to be confidential is because even the lives of the justices are are threatened as a result. Kerry, what steps do you think justices should take so this kind of uh, thing doesn't happen again? How do they protect the confidentiality of these draft opinions moving forward, knowing that the trust has been broken at this point? Well, the best thing uh, that we could have done would be swiftly finding and firing the clerk involved. Unfortunately, that has not happened. And that's, that is kind of shocking to me because I feel like there's a small universe of people who would have had access to this decision. And most of them are the clerks. Each justice has four clerks. There's only nine justices. I mean, they maybe, maybe a couple different staff members in each chambers could have access. But again, there's, that's not a large universe of people that, that would have had access to this opinion. So I'm discouraged that the chief justice has not yet been able to find the leaker. Or I guess maybe if he has, he hasn't announced it, but I, I think that's unlikely. The, the clerks are scheduled to leave starting in the beginning of, of July. So the term's over and then the clerks start, start switching to the next term's clerks. One of these clerks, if it was, this is who it was who leaked it, is going to be leaving with no consequences. And better yet, you know, the, the typical bonus 
at a, starting at a law firm, if you've been a Supreme Court clerk, is now up to $400,000. So someone is going to, though, then after undermining and really just wrecking the institutional integrity of the court, is then going to use their job at the court to make nearly half a million dollars just in signing bonus alone. That's shocking to me. So I think, I don't know if there's anything left to, that, that, that the chief uh, can do in this last week to find this person, but I think the, the the person responsible, if they're not punished for it, then you know we saw one leaked opinion this term, we're gonna see 10 leaked opinions next term. It is uh, very discouraging because if there's no consequences for this type of behavior, we're only going to see more of it by by people who just think uh, they're going to be able to game the system in the Supreme Court more. It will be a huge blow to the integrity of the court. For clerks and certainly clerks of anyone else. Absolutely, Carrie. In healthcare professional world, even really revealing the name first and last name yeah. would get us fired. <laughs> right. Yeah, it should. Yes. <laughs> it, it does. It does, and it should. You are a hundred percent right. So uh, my I'm, husband used to used to implement HIPAA. So he's. <laughs> I understand health privacy, but how is it that this person doesn't understand the the confidentiality that a lawyer has to maintain as well? I don't know. Absolutely. So, uh, I mean, Carrie, I'm not sure if you would like to answer this. I was wondering if you ever got a chance to talk to Justice Scalia. The reason I ask is, how do you feel about these activist federal judges? <laughs> yeah, so one of the great, I mean, there's so many great things about clerking at the Supreme Court. It's kind of you walk up every day and pinch yourself going, I can't believe this is where I come to work every day. It's so cool. Um, you just want to kind of suck the marrow out of that that one short year of, of, of the experience. But one of the great pleasures is, there's a tradition that the clerks of each chambers will ask all of the other justices out to lunch. And most of them would take us up on it, you know, even though that we're, you know, there's someone else's clerks, but Justice Scalia very generously did agree to go out to lunch with us. And we had a lovely lunch at a tour. We took him to an Italian restaurant because we knew he liked that and had some great wine with him. And um, it was just so much fun to get to meet him. It was funny. Half the time he was talking about his, his hunting exploits. He had a goal of trying to, uh, get eat one of each kind of native turkey to the to America. <laughs> it's like so. It was just really fun to get to talk and and sit with someone who we admired so much, um, but also who really was a um, just a symbol of judges standing up against, as you see, the the, the judicial activism that was before he was uh, nominated so prevalent. I mean, for a long time, including the the Republican nominees, just across the board. Judges were incredibly activist. Um, some of the worst judicial activists had been Republican appointees. You think of someone like Earl Warren, who was a Nixon, or no, he's an Eisenhower appointee. Um, and Nixon appointed some some real, you know, bad bad ones as well. Ford appointed John Paul Stevens, who was a, one of the most liberal justices when I clerked in the court. Um, Scalia was really where that started to turn when 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 Ronald Reagan appointed him, and I think his appointment. Uh, was is kind of where the tide started to turn and where the left started to realize they stood the potential of losing the court for a long time. They had a kind of a stranglehold and they knew that they could go to the court to get whatever they wanted. When Justice Scalia joined, uh, I think they saw that ending and it was not no surprise that immediately after that with Robert Bork, they started putting up much more fights during judicial confirmation processes to try to stop uh, that from happening. And it's taken 50 years really to even can achieve uh, the goals that Reagan started by appointing Scalia. But so, yeah, it, it, he, it, he was an amazing um, person and amazing model and mentor for so many of us. So thank you for sharing. That's a very personal story. I'm thankful that you were able to share here. So Carrie, should there be term limits on Supreme Court judge, uh, judges? I know it's a loaded question, but I was just curious to know your input. Well, I would actually be fine with having term limits for Supreme Court justices. The minor problem is the Supreme Court gives them life tenure. So that's the kind of thing where I think, you know what, if we could get together a, um, a bipartisan coalition, because the thing about amending the Supreme Court is it is intentionally made with a very high bar. You don't want each party, you know, gain a 51% control of Congress and then be able to amend the Constitution. That would be, that would create a huge, you know, yo-yo effect. So our, the framers knew we need to make this a very high bar so we only can do it when there's a very overwhelming majority. So to amend the Constitution, to change that life tenure, you would have to have a very large majority. I think that's a great asset because it means you'd have to do it not in a way that like the Democrats kind of are trying to do now with this packing the court idea where they just want to add seats so that their president can add a bunch of guys on at once and, and shift the balance. You would have to do it in a way 
where you know it, it, maybe the 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 seats at seats were added over a period so that different presidents were able to they were they were staggered so different presidents would have different opportunities so it you'd have to design it so neither party was advantaged either by the way it it was phased in or by the system later and that's actually a real asset to it so i think i would i would definitely support a, uh, a constitutional amendment to that end. That's not something we're likely to see happening quickly because it would take a long process. But um, I think in an, in an age where people are living so much longer than they did in the early years of the court and where people, where the role of the court is so much more important. And in, in the early Republic, it wasn't even considered that big of a deal. There were people who got appointments and didn't want them or, or who left early because they, oh, I want to run for governor of New York instead. You know? So um, nowadays the court uh, for better or for worse, I think in some ways for worse, it's amassed a lot of power, but it also means people are less willing to step down either because of age or ability or just to simply simply because they're doing something else. And so maybe life tenure wouldn't be, uh, you know, may, might make more sense now than it than it did when the framers were considering it. Such a different world we live in. What do you think of Supreme Court packing, Carrie, while you're right on the topic? Yeah, I, I, that this is a huge problem, I think, and and one of the many real attacks on the integrity of the court we've seen. Um, when when FDR first came up with the idea of packing the court in 1937, he was seeing a court um, that was getting in the way of his New Deal policies. He was a Democrat president, had these aggressive New Deal policies he wanted to get. He had he had overwhelmingly support in Congress for this, but the court was saying wait a minute, some of the stuff you're proposing is unconstitutional. And he was really sick of it. And he said, well, I just need to get rid of these justices and get new justices. He knew, of course, they have life tenure. So his idea was, let's just add justices on. Um, even his overwhelming support from the Democrats in Congress at the time said, wow, that is a horrible idea. Because here's what's going to happen. It turns the court into just a political football. Obviously, there's always a political nature to the confirmation process. That, that's kind of by design so that we have our elected representatives involved in choosing these, the men and women who sit on the bench, but you don't want to make it into something where each time a new president comes in and, ha and, and can manage to align a Congress in their favor, they just add a bunch of seats. You're going to have, you know, just it just keeps ratcheting up, especially when you do have life tenure there. So it, it's something that we've seen happen in places like Venezuela, unfortunately. You know, they what they did is they, you know, a new pre president comes in, a Castro, or, or not, not, but the new president comes in and they just say, hey, we're going to add new, add more judges. And then suddenly all the judges he adds like him. And then next guy comes in and Maduro comes in. It's like, hey, we're going to add some more judges. And it just keeps ratcheting up. And you go from, you can go from nine to like 99 really quickly. Um, that would be horrible for the continuity and the consistency of our country. What's scary to me is something that was just viewed as dead on arrival, obviously bad idea for just right after FDR did it for the next 70, 80, almost 90 years was something that now the liberal activists on the left, the dark money forces on the left, because there's a lot of money behind this court packing idea, um, are trying to normalize and make a good idea again. I think it was very telling that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, when she was initially asked about this kind of on the front end of their push said, oh no, that's a horrible idea. It was a bad idea when FDR did it. And she ought to know she was like old enough to have been, <laughs> practically been around then, right? She recognized as a liberal icon, it was just a horrible idea. I think most of the Democrats in Congress also recognize it's a horrible idea. It would be really bad for our national institutions, but they feel the pressure from the loud voices and the deep pockets on the left who are saying, no, we, we can't wait for another election. I mean, AOC was just texting this or, we, or tweeting this. Well, how can we wait around for an election to get what we want? Well, it's because that's the American way. We live in a rule of law. We don't say, hey, I didn't get what I want. I'm going to tantrum and riot until I do. And that's the court packing idea is sort of a, you know, one step removed level of this tantrum and rioting. We didn't get what we want. We're not going to wait. We don't, we don't want to wait for the American people to line up with what we want to do. We're just going to force it down their throats ourselves. And that is something that would be, I think, horrible for our country. The scary thing is we're literally like one vote or two votes away, maybe from doing that. If, if Manchin and Cinema decided not to stand strong on this issue, uh, like thankfully they have many, you know, vastly overwhelming majority of things, they vote with Biden, but they were willing to stand up on this. And I'm grateful to them because, um, but, but we know that, you know, if we, if we lost one seat in the Senate in the fall, you could easily see court packing come to be a reality. There's already a bill out there that they're trying to add uh, four more seats onto the Supreme Court. 
I can't imagine something that would be worse for the Supreme Court, for American law, for our constitution and, and our country. That sounds very scary. Carrie, I know your time is very precious. Questions are pouring in. I've had comments that say Carrie is outstanding. So thank you for articulating. If you have two minutes, I just do have two questions for you. What are the opinions are still due to be released for this term? Yeah, so there are, I think, seven opinions left. We, the only day that's scheduled to announce them is Monday. They could announce them all on Monday, but it could be very possible they'd add another day, either Tuesday or Wednesday or something to announce the last few. Most of the big ones have come out, but there's still some really important ones. I think the three that are most interesting that I'm watching for are the, the Coach Kennedy case, Kennedy versus Bremerton. This is the, the coach, the football coach who, who was a public school coach and used to pray after football games and was reprimanded for doing so and ultimately lost his job, um, even though it was after you know, the game was done and just doing it as a private individual. So that's an important religious freedom case coming up. Uh, there's one that has to do with the remain in Mexico policy that President Biden is trying to undo what Trump was doing on the immigration front. And uh, so the question is, does he have the authority to just reverse course so quickly? Something, you know, with the in the executive branch, there are fewer hurdles than like changing law completely. You don't have to pass a law, but you still do have to follow the procedures and you still need to do abide by the laws that have been put in place by Congress. And so the, that that is going to be considered uh, or, or decided by the court. And then finally, there's an important case uh, that the state of West Virginia is suing over the clean power plan. This goes back to you know, President Obama's regulations, and then Trump undid them. And now Biden is kind of re-putting some of those back. But it, it goes back to this question of how, how is the administrative state governed by the Constitution? Because we know in the Constitution, we've got like the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. There's this whole other branch that's kind of grown up of the regulatory states, all these bureaucrats that just make regulations that have the force of law, but they don't have to go through the checks and balances that were built into the Constitution. They don't have to get passed by two houses of Congress and signed by the president. So sometimes you have them basically trying to make up their own law, which is what is at issue in this case. Can they come up with these regulations that actually go farther than what the actual law is that was passed by Congress? And so it's how much, you know, are the, is this regulatory state that's operating in kind of a constitutional limbo over here? Um, is it real, how is the court going to make sure that it is bound to sticking within the bounds of the actual laws that are passed by Congress and signed by the president? So, um, so it's really important, not just for what's going to happen with environmental policy following that. Is it going to be, you know, limited to what the, the Clean Air Act actually says? But it, it's, it's an area that many presidents tend to overuse because they say, hey, it's too much trouble to get Congress to do what we want. We're just going to, you know, go over here and regulate our way into exactly what we want. But we need to make sure that those regulations are still governed by our constitutional structure. Thank you. So thank you so much for explaining. That was our most popular question. Um, Carrie, last question, I promise. As a minority, I can never let you go without saying that. I do believe in representation matter, diversity matter, but I don't believe in uh, critical um, uh, uh, CRT whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So my question to you is, should there be a criterion for nominating and confirming Sup Supreme Court justices? Should gender or race or other immutable characteristics even play a role? Or uh, is it going to be purely focused on on skill set in the selection process, their experience, or even for that matter, political leanings. How does that work? So I think what a president should do is choose the man and woman who have a record of interpreting the Constitution as it's written and interpreting uh, and, and, and the courage to stand up behind that. And I think when you do that uh, fairly and looking at it, who's, who has those principles, you actually do end up with a diverse judiciary. And when we saw with under President Trump, that is what happened. He didn't get the credit for it that I think he deserved. I think a lot of people were hoping that he would have a judiciary that was in fact more diverse than, than the group of lawyers out there he was choosing from. And that's, that is unreasonable, I think, and, and turns it into a check the box kind of quota system rather than a, um, than a system where you're actually looking at who is most qualified. But there, he, he did end up with, for example, you know, I, I'm thinking of I think people like Amul Thapar, who was the first uh, South Asian on his circuit in the Sixth Circuit, as well as Naomi Rao, the first South Asian. Uh, oh, actually, no, she was the second. She was the first woman on uh, on the D.C. Circuit because Sri Srinivasan got, got there before her. Um, but also it covered diversity over a lot of other areas. So Judge Willett in the Fifth Circuit, he grew up in a trailer park uh, raised by a single mom. 
yeah, he's a white man, but I think he brings a really different perspective there. Judge Ho, who himself was an immigrant, you know, that brings brings an interesting perspective. Judge Katzis in the D.C. Circuit, the first Greek judge to that to that circuit, you know. Uh, so I, I, you know, there's there's a lot more there are a lot more details to that uh, than I think we see. Uh, judge Barbara Lagoa, who almost made it to the Supreme Court, she she was a, a close uh, you know finalist along with Amy Coney Barrett for that spot. And I think the other thing. That, make, that is important to me also as, as a woman looking at this is, I really value the idea that um, someone like Judge Barrett knows that she was chosen, not because, oh, we need a woman to check this box and fill this spot. And Justice Thomas dealt with this as well. P to people saying, oh, you're only there because you oh, just God. checked this box, right? You're, you're there because they needed a black man. No, he was there because he is. The, and if you look at him compared to all these other nominees, before before he picked Justice Thomas, uh, you know, President Bush picked Judge Souter, a white man. I, I think no one could, in, in this on this call is probably going to argue that Justice Thomas was a much better pick, not because of the color of his skin, but because of his outstanding legal approach and his courage on the bench. That should be the reason. And, and I think I, it, it makes it it cheapens um, the success of the people who, who have achieved so much, if, the, if everyone is saying, oh, no, you only did this because uh, you're checking a box. And I think that's an unfortunate aspect to uh, soon to be Justice Jackson's appointment as well, because I think that creates a cloud that hangs over her. She can, she's always wondering, you know, would I have been picked if I really was be if, if President Biden was really choosing from amongst the whole slate. So I, I, I think that, that uh, I'm glad to say that under Trump, I think everyone there can say, yes, I was chosen because I am an outstanding lawyer. And uh, I think that's something that I would hope we can continue to do going forward. I think it'll also continue to lead to a, a diverse judici a judiciary, but not one that's chosen purely for the sake of judici diversity, but one that just reflects the, the diversity that we represent here together as it is. Couldn't agree with you more, Kerry. Kerry, thank you so much for your time. I know this is a valuable time for you. It's a weekend. You're taking time away from your six wonderful children, but also I know you. I've been watching uh, you on Laura Ingram's show and any every other show. Thank you for taking the time, GOP leadership. Uh, thanks you uh, for actually being one of our. Um, I, I hate to call mouthpiece, but really doing the great work that you are doing out there. So for viewers that uh, that probably may not know. Kerry Severino, I think most of you know, she is an expert on the confirmation process. Mrs. Severino has been extensively quoted, quoted in the media and regularly appears on television, including MSNBC, Fox, CNN too, C-SPAN oh, yeah. and ABCs this week. I've watched her on CNN myself. So um, uh, Kerry, thank you again for coming in. I appreciate you. I appreciate your export and thank you for being out there. So courageous, so bold, and so articulate on uh, things that many of us would kind of uh, want to understand more and more. Have a wonderful evening and uh, viewers, well, um, thank you for watching this and we will continue to keep, keep in tune with the future shows. Thank you so much. Thanks.